So now without further ado, Mark McCandlish is my guest. He and I were on a show together. I'm trying to remember, was that with Rebecca Jernigan, Mark? That was with Paul Price. Okay, and that would have been on this network. I think that was about a week ago, maybe a little more, and we had such a great conversation that I really had to invite you on my own show. Thank uh, you very much. I enjoyed it, too. Yeah, you, you were a great guest, and people were just really excited to get the science behind the chemtrail story and also the, the way that mind control can be wrapped into the harp situation, et cetera, et cetera, and we kind of went in those directions. What I'd like to do before we go kind of, and I don't, I don't mind going back to that subject matter, but I would like to start off with, as I told you, our conversation sort of off the record, that I'd love people to recognize who you are. I do have a link to your website on the front page of Project Camelot where the radio show is. It says guest bio, and you can click there and get Mark's website, which I'd like people to do because I want everyone to click on the images. You will see some of his amazing drawings. I can't recommend them enough. And Mark, uh, with that introduction, would you kind of explain something of your history and how you got into this field? Okay, well, uh, thank you very much again for having me back, um, or, or at least uh, having this opportunity to speak with you and your audience, uh, Carrie. I really appreciate it. As far as the uh, the website is concerned, it, it did sustain uh, sustain some damage uh, a number of months ago. Uh, my website was actually hacked by uh, this notorious hacking group. I think they call themselves Anonymous or Notorious or something. I I can't remember what the name of it is, but uh, strangely, the uh, the the logo that they put onto my website was flying the Somalian flag. So I'm not really sure what that meant, what the significance of it was, but but. Um, Anyway, as far as my career, I uh, uh, grew up as a, uh, an Air Force dependent. My dad was in the Air Force for 25 years, and um, one of the uh, last duty stations where he was at was uh, West Oak Air Force Base up in Chicopee, Massachusetts, uh, into the mid to late 1960s uh, when he retired. Uh, around 1966 in February, I had a, uh, a sighting of a craft that, as I found out much later, um, was actually hovering over the area at the south end of the uh, the runway complex where they kept the alert aircraft and Westover was a strategic air command base where they had B-52 aircraft and, and nuclear weapons and uh, the, the alert aircraft area, uh, you can find this on Google Earth it, at one end of the runway, looks like kind of a herringbone pattern of uh, sort of uh, a number of uh, runways that all converge in what look like a series of arrowheads that are one after the other and they had a series of aircraft that were parked there, loaded with weapons, ready to go uh, at a moment's notice in case uh, we got into some kind of a shooting conflict with the Russians or the Chinese. So um, uh, I happened to see this thing and, and uh, became a bit of a, an obsessive little kid. I watched this thing for 10 minutes through a telescope, and it uh, basically looked like a big uh, floating ball of plasma with colors swirling across the surface of it. And then... Uh, you know, I began clipping newspaper articles, and I created a bulletin board in my grammar school. And then all of a sudden, one day, it just it stopped. And um, looking back over that time period, uh, the strangest thing was that I had no memory whatsoever of number one having the sighting, and number two, putting up all of these these uh, bulletins for my other fellow students to look at. And uh, I, so I wound up actually going to Yvonne Smith, who I think you may know, and was hypnotically regressed around 1989. And that uh, event was precipitated after spending a number of years uh, working in the Air Force. Uh, I worked on um, uh, aircraft electronics, um, the MA-1 weapon system, ASQ-25 radar systems on F-106 fighter planes, and McCord Air Force Base up near Tacoma, Washington. I uh, had gone through an extensive um, electronic school and so forth, and I uh, then went to, to a, a number of colleges on the GI Bill. I went to Springfield Technical Community College, uh, studying psychology in Springfield, Massachusetts, uh, Holyoke Community College, uh, studying art and design, went to uh, Brigham Young University for a short time, studying design, and then I used my portfolio that had been created in this time to get admitted to Art Center College of Design in Pasadena where I initially was studying uh, automotive design and then switched to illustration. By the time I got out of uh, school, 
there were really no jobs for anyone in the automotive industry. The uh, Japanese uh, imports had started to take a substantial market share, so there really weren't any jobs available. So I, I wound up applying for a job uh, at General Dynamics and um, actually got the job with my portfolio and worked there for several years as a conceptual artist. And after a time, I realized that um, the the skills that I had at the time were actually, I could market them much more effectively uh, while working for a variety of different defense contractors. Instead of just, just doing one project at a time for one contractor, I was able to work for dozens of different defense contractors. Got to see an awful lot of hardware, a lot of classified things, and... and um, but in the middle of all this, I, I just uh, somewhere around 1985 or 86, uh, after I had left General Dynamics, uh, I got a call from Lockheed Skunk Works through their Calabasas, uh, California division, and they had asked me to come up and create some conceptual artwork for a, uh, an aircraft that was um, the, the the second generation in the family of existing aircraft that were all classified. The the strange thing about this was that they. They could not tell me what the aircraft looked like. They could not tell me what the aircraft that I was supposed to draw looked like because it was all classified above the the level of secret, which was the, the, the level of um, security clearance that I had at the time. And I said, well, so how am I going to be able to help you with all of this? And they said, well, we, we just want you to create a, a fictitious aircraft that looks very, very fast because we need to put together some artwork to sort of uh, dress up a, uh, a proposal that we're going to submit to the Senate Arms uh, um, Services Committee, Appropriations Committee, to fund the development of this new family of aircraft. So I said, okay, I'll see what I can come up with. And I, I immediately went into my archive, pulled up images of the XB-70, which was a North American aircraft, um, Rockwell um, uh, aircraft that had been created in the 60s. It was capable of something close to Mach 3, plus the SR-71 Blackbird. And um, I um, basically combined features of these two aircraft, and it wound up being a, a, a large aircraft with uh, the smaller wings up towards the front like uh, canards, very much like uh, on the XB-70, a large uh, triangular wing like the... Uh, the wing of both those aircraft types with uh, a pair of uh, large box-like engine nacelles under the center line of the aircraft with the vertical stabilizers, the tails, the two tails, um, extended out to the wingtips. Then I had a, a chine, very much like the one on the SR-71 Blackbird that runs down the side of the aircraft. It looks kind of like a razor edge along the perimeter of the, the fuselage. It's part of its uh, stealth technology. and I incorporated all of these features into the aircraft and did the sketch took it in to uh, Lockheed, uh, um, and when I was met there, they had brought in a couple of engineers from Skunk Works, and as soon as I opened up my sketch pad, I thought these two guys were going to have a heart attack. And I didn't really understand why they were so upset, but the gist of what I got was they suspected that someone had, had divulged classified information to me because the aircraft that uh, I had drawn apparently looked very much like something that they had under development. Um, this very aircraft uh, was later and has been seen a number of times by a variety of individuals. It's actually, I think it's called the, the M121 or the Mothership or the Super Valkyrie. But at any rate, I had stumbled across, um, just, just through my own conceptual work, I basically stumbled across a program that I wasn't supposed to know about. And so ever since that time, I, you know, there's just this sort of an undercurrent, this sense that Everything I do is kind of being watched, and and as as things turned out, um, I think that was probably true. But as it happened, uh, because of that, there were a number of other occasions where uh, information was presented to me that that I had not expected to see, uh, and, and one of those events happened to pretty much come to a head in November of 1988 when I was supposed to meet a friend of mine from college um, at an air show at Norton Air Force Base in San Bernardino, California. Uh, it turned out at the last minute that uh, I had a, uh, a very pricey, quick turnaround assignment for Popular Science Magazine that I had to turn around on the weekend. It was a sudden thing, so I wasn't able to go to the air show. My friend wound up meeting there with one of his clients, which was a gentleman who'd been a former Undersecretary of Defense, 
And uh, he and a number of other people met in a large hangar at uh, Norton Air Force Base, a hangar that's still there, is owned by Lockheed, were put on a military passenger jet and flown up to Air Force Plant 42. Um, and they were basically escorted into the Lockheed Skunk Works building where they were shown a number of aircraft that had been under development and were sort of being kept under wraps that had not been shown to the public. And, and this included the the, um, the losing prototype in the competition for the B-2 stealth bomber, which eventually was won by the, the team of Northrop Grumman. But the other team was Lockheed and, uh, and Rockwell and National. Okay, we have a, a short break here. We'll be right back with Mark McCandlish. Thank you, Mark. This is Carrie Cassidy, Project Camelot with the Blur Radio. And uh, Mark, are you still there? Yes, I am. Okay, so you were going through the, the Skunk Works. Uh, you were talking about that, and I think you were kind of wrapping your story up a bit. But do you yeah. want to finish that that part sure. of it that you were interrupted? Yeah, when the when the break came along, I was uh, talking about how with this uh, friend of mine from uh, college, Brad, had uh, been flown up to uh, Air Force Plant 42 in Palmdale and escorted along with his friend from the uh, the Pentagon into the Skunk Works building where they had a number of aircraft, which included uh, a uh, a variety of sort of high tech uh, hovercraft. Uh, also included the uh, the losing competitor in the B-2 flying wing stealth program, which was uh, this particular aircraft uh, looked remarkably similar to a black flying wing mock-up that Honda used in its commercials to introduce the CRX hatchback back in the uh, the nineteen the mid nineteen eighties. Um, it cre created quite a stir in the defense industry, and also there was a um, first generation aircraft. Um, in what was called the Aurora program, uh, it was also referred to as the uh, the Aurora Pulsar. Um, this was a large, uh, sort of diamond-shaped aircraft, um, and it it was similar to a flattened-out football kind of a shape with uh, no cockpit. This was a, a very, very large, remotely piloted vehicle capable of going exo atmospheric or out into space. It had a variety of different propulsion systems, one of which would allow it to uh, take off from a runway in a conventional manner, uh, climb to a higher altitude where it would uh, then uh, change over to uh, an advanced propulsion system that was uh, notorious for leaving a contrail that some people described as donuts on a rope. It was basically uh, kind of like a pulse detonation uh, linear aerospike engine uh, and for those of your audience who don't recognize what that is, it's it's kind of a cone-shaped device or afterbody on the tail end of the aircraft, and you introduce uh, fuel into the airstream around the, the tail section of the aircraft, and because at this point the aircraft is traveling at such a high speed, the air around it being displaced by the fuselage is superheated and highly compressed, and so the fuel spontaneously ex explodes, it combusts, and the explosion then expands around the afterbody, and it, it pinches it. It causes it to drive the aircraft forward at a higher velocity. Um, so in, in addition to these aircraft, um, there also happened to be a separate area in this exhibit uh, in the Lockheed Skunk Works behind a big curtain that uh, stretched from floor to ceiling, and when it was pulled back, the audience was allowed to see three flying saucers. Now, these flying saucers looked uh, an awful lot like the old, uh, uh, I guess what were called jello mold or bell-shaped uh, UFOs that uh, people often associated with some of the early UFO sightings from the 1940s and 1950s, uh, pretty much a, a flat uh, surface on the bottom with uh, sloping sides that came up to about the midpoint on the aircraft, there was a, a slight shelf, and then in the middle of that shelf was the uh, sort of a dome, which was actually the upper half of a uh, uh, composite sphere that formed the crew compartment. Um, on the upper half of the sphere were, uh, I think, as many as uh, six or seven of these uh, clear glass uh, domes, and under each one was a, a camera system, or what was referred to as a synthetic vision system. Um, the uh, This friend of mine had an opportunity not only to... Uh, walk up uh, one of the l rolling um, staircases that they use for airlines and so forth um, 
and uh, look into the cockpit area and see some of the details inside the aircraft. But we also had a cutaway illustration of this vehicle on an easel standing next to the vehicle, and they also had a, a television with a, a short video that showed the aircraft hovering over what appeared to be a dry lake bed um, and suddenly making three sort of sidelong hopping motions, sort of up and down, up and down, and moving sideways. And then as the camera tracked this movement, the vehicle stopped momentarily and then accelerated straight up and out of sight as the camera, you know, tilted up and followed it, with the aircraft disappearing from view in just under two seconds. So it, it obviously showed that uh, this was an aircraft that uh, was capable of uh, dramatic uh, accelerations far beyond what the... Uh, uh, it seems uh, any pilot could, uh, any human pilot could withstand um, without, uh, you know, being turned into a pile of hamburger on the inside of the aircraft. And so, uh, as uh, the, the weeks after this event passed, uh, I got in touch with my friend, and and he seemed uh, uh, different from his usual manner. He, he seemed uh, upset and, and disturbed and. And eventually he told me the story of what he'd seen, and, and he began to give me some of the details because I, I just think that he, he really needed somebody to talk to about it. And the thing that was so surprising was that uh, eight years earlier I had begun a correspondence with Tom Bearden, so I knew an awful lot about scalar energy, zero-point energy, quantum fluctuations of the uh, the vacuum, and, and what all of that meant and how one might propose to tap those kinds of, uh, of energy resources. And so uh, when Brad began to describe what this aircraft, uh, what the propulsion technology was based on, that namely it was using uh, quantum zero-point fluctuations of vacuum or uh, the slang term might be scalar energy or zero-point energy, uh, I was right there with him and understood everything that he was saying. And Brad... Brad is kind of a, a very competitive individual, and so the more he told me, which I understood, I think he, he felt compelled to tell me a little bit more to see if there was something that I didn't know. And uh, fortunately or unfortunately, I, I was able to follow everything he was saying. And so what it boiled down to was the device, because of the way it was constructed, uh, used what amounted to a, a very, very powerful capacitor array and, and a very large Tesla coil sort of, uh, or concentrically located. Basically, imagine a, a pizza pie that's been divided up into 48 thin wedges, each one of those wedges representing a capacitor package of about eight plates embedded in a kind of quartz and that standing... Well, uh, actually, Mark, let me stop you here. It, you Are you describing the ARV at this point? Yes. Yes, okay, sir. because there, I, you know, I can direct people. I, I found the ARV on your site, a yeah. picture of it, and that would be right. helpful for people, I think, if they go to the link, again, on the front page of Camelot uh, at the radio show where it says bio. That takes you to markmccandlish.com, and then if you click on unusual craft and you use the drop-down and go to ARV cutaway, uh, that drawing, that's actually a, a pretty famous drawing at this point that you did. Uh, and that's what you're describing. Is that correct? Yes, that's right. Now, the uh, it, it, one of the interesting things about uh, sort of synchronicitous things that happened along this time frame was that about this time, the Los Angeles Times, the newspaper, uh, began uh, making note of some of the crop circles that were occurring over in uh, the United Kingdom. And I happened to come across one of those articles because I was living in the Los Angeles area at the time. And the 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 really strange coincidental thing that it managed to, that it mentioned was that that uh, some of the scientists who were investigating this phenomenon said that after a crop circle had appeared, they would notice that the impact of whatever force field or whatever it was on the crop would linger throughout the year. And when the crop grew back the following year, it had an unusual signature. No matter what the crop circle had looked like during the time of its creation, when the crop grew back a year later, it grew back as a circle with 48 individual spokes. Well, it just so happens that 48 is the exact number of capacitor sections in the ARV. And so I found that to be fascinating. And so it, it started to make me think that 
you know, the, the business of, uh, you know, the, the crops being laid down, the growth nodes being exploded outward, all the different features and, you know, the, the, uh, the, the wilting of the plants without kinking or, or breaking, those are all things that I eventually was able to figure out and communicated to Linda Howe. And, um, and something I can explain later on if you're interested. But so carrying on with the description of this propulsion system, smack dab in the middle of this, this capacitor array was a central column, which is actually the central, uh, central core of a, a large Tesla coil. The little shelf that's about halfway up on the exterior of the craft actually happens to be the top half of the primary windings of a Tesla coil. And the Tesla coil is wound in a very special way. It has a, a multitude of about 9 to 12 layers, uh, and that the, each, each uh, layer starting from the bottom to the top is, is uh, slightly smaller in diameter, so you actually have a kind of taper on the outer uh, perimeter of this coil. And, and if you uh, look into any of Nikola Tesla's patents, you'll find that he did, in fact, create a Tesla coil that did use a, a conical-shaped primary winding, uh, or what might be called a frustrum-shaped winding. It's a slice out of a cone, basically. And that this particular configuration allowed the Tesla coil to operate at much higher uh, voltages without a uh, um, high voltage breakdown or arcing over and shorting of the circuit. So the, the primary windings uh, can uh, form this ring around the belt line of the crew compartment, which is uh, basically a ball shape or a sphere-shaped compartment. And the central column that goes up through the middle of it is the secondary windings of the Tesla coil, which is basically a large cylindrical shape. In this case, the smallest of the three vehicles was uh, about 24 feet in diameter. It's ex at, at the bottom edge of this craft, it's exactly twice the diameter of the crew compartment. So the crew compartment's 12 feet in diameter. It's a ball, so it means the column itself is 12, 12 feet high. So you can imagine... If you've ever seen an extremely large Tesla coil in operation, you know that you can get over a million volts out of a Tesla coil that's only two or three feet high. So if you have one that's 12 feet high, you can imagine that we're probably talking several million volts easily uh, when this thing operates. Now inside the, the center column of, of this, uh, this Tesla coil was a, a chamber that was uh, filled with, with mercury. Now, um, there's been a lot of debate about just exactly what that means, the, the use of mercury. Um, it turned out that I think it was Timothy Good um, had written a book a number of years ago that, that discussed um, some ruins in Poland at the Wenzelis mine that included uh, something that w had been created as part of uh, a Nazi project at the end of the Second World War, World War called, I believe it was Die Glocke, which means the bell or the Nazi bell. And this particular device was a, a ceramic uh, um, bell-shaped device that did have a central column that, that was comprised of two counter-rotating cylinders with a mercury solution inside that included thorium and a beryllium uh, oxide or peroxide of beryllium. Um, and so when I began investigating that particular aspect of the operation, I found that uh, there are certain qualities that mercury has, particularly when it's subjected to bucking or counter-opposed magnetic fields. Um, also, when you, you add, um, say, nanoparticles of beryllium and thorium, you get some uh, performance changes that enhance the, the, um, the unusual effects of subjecting mercury to a powerful magnetic field. But the long and the short of it is that this device, uh, when it's in operation, creates an extremely powerful electromagnetic pulse. And this pulse, in a way, has the effect of polarizing space-time. This polarization process then creates a kind of vector in space-time that you can then use to propel the craft and push it through space-time, while at the same time it affords you the opportunity to draw some of that zero-point energy out of the vacuum of space-time rectify it, convert it into energy or electrical power, and that power increases the faster you go, the more energy is available. This is the very reason that Einstein said that it's impossible to exceed the speed of light because as you increase, your mass increases. As your acceleration becomes higher and higher, your mass increases. And, and so nobody ever really stopped to explain to us, you know, in school or in physics or anything else, why is that? And it's essentially because... If you imagine that zero-point energy is like an evenly distributed uh, pattern of little packets of energy that are distributed in the environment, 
uh, like droplets of rain, for example, and, and you're wearing a heavy coat and you're walking through the rain and you get a little wet, but if you run through the rain or if you're riding on a motorcycle through that same rain, you get much wetter and much heavier, much like, you know, a faster rate of acceleration will increase your weight, your, well, not your weight, but your mass. Uh, and so if you find a way that you can actually use that, that um, energy in the environment as a source of propulsive power, you wind up having an energy source, almost like solar energy, solar power. You find a way of exploiting an energy resource in the environment. But as you do this, you're also taking away the very energy source, and this is according to uh, theoretical physicist Hal Putoff, that zero-point energy may actually be the basis for the creation of mass, the creation of inertia, and gravity. So if zero-point energy is distributed through the environment and you begin using that as your propulsive power source, it also means that you're conserving energy, but at the same time, you're taking away the very thing that would add to the mass of the vehicle. So the faster you go, the lower the mass of your vehicle and the faster the vehicle will go because you're using all that energy and converting it into propulsive force. And you're doing it. Uh, if, you, if you look at the 1994 paper in physics essay by Miguel Acubieri about the warp drive system that he was proposing, he essentially said that you create a vector in space-time what he was calling a dynamically engineered local space-time. And what you're doing is you're, you're pretty much, you're, you're compressing space-time, like, almost like creating a singularity or a black hole that's out ahead of you through this polarization process, and you're creating an expansion of space-time, almost like a supernova, like an exploding star behind you. And so you add these two things together, and it creates a tremendous propulsive force. But the, the interesting key here is that you're, you're acting upon a, a ball-shaped or a sphere-shaped pocket of dynamically engineered local space-time. And, of course, space-time is essentially a vacuum. And so if you move that space-time uh, ball, that, that dynamically engineered local space-time, as a complete package, including everything that's inside of that package, there's no g-forces, there's no sensation of acceleration. And so you can do all of these things. And, I mean, as complex as the mathematics uh, is for this kind of thing. You can you can uh, uh, understand essentially how dramatic something like this could be created, elegantly simple and yet extremely complex. Thank you for that. A uh, very very clear explanation. I think that people will find that valuable uh, and rather unexpected. I I want to tell people that that you don't just design uh, or illustrate the outside of these vehicles. You actually understand dynamically how they work in order to draw them. Isn't that right? Well, that's that's true. I mean, uh, I, I loved working on cars when I was a little kid. And, and uh, you know, I, uh, in fact, right before I came on the air, I was helping a friend uh, pull a transmission out of his car. So, you know, I, I like working on things mechanically. The nice thing about sort of being a conceptual artist is that you, you really do have to understand the mechanics and the engineering behind anything that you illustrate so that, for example, if you're designing a car and you have a certain slope of the windshield, you don't create side windows in the doors that are too big to roll down into the windows so that it won't actually fit. So you have to be able to, to visualize and see through is one of the terms that's used often in the industry. You have to be able to sort of, sort of you know, exercise sort of a, a mental uh, you know, x-ray vision, if you will, to kind of imagine, <clears throat> you know, what these things will look like, what they work, how they will work, and and then be able to to uh, create this, uh, you know, a, a compositionally and as a, uh, you know, a, a fully engineered design so that uh, that it works. Right um, now, about this ARV because this is an interesting story in and of itself, and I know some background about it. Let me say, for one thing, because, well, Gordon Novell, who's very notorious, and people will know him because I interviewed him. Actually, I understand he recently went into the hospital, and I don't know if you're aware of that. Uh, I don't know if you guys are in touch and what the latest is. I, I know he had a group together, and he wanted to create these, what he called ARVs. I don't know if they're going to be based on this design or they're going to be a takeoff on this design. And that gets back to the question about whether or not this indeed this ARV that you were designing that was based on something real, whether that indeed was one of ours or one of theirs, as they say. 
Well, yes, I know Gordon. I, I've known Gordon for uh, about 24 years, and we've we uh, we had kind of a a, a cordial uh, relationship in the beginning, and uh, it was uh, initially a uh, <clears throat> sort of a three-way agreement between um, Gordon, his friend uh, Dr. George Ulick, who used to work for uh, Hercules Aerospace and near Salt Lake City, and I, and and we we had an agreement that. Uh, you know, if we developed anything that would be able to exploit zero-point energy or anti-gravity or any of these things, that uh, you know we would share, you know, share the the, the benefits of that three ways. And uh, but what I didn't know was that after I had produced the uh, the cutaway illustration, which initially was just a blueprint of the the craft itself without any callouts, uh, Gordon had asked me to produce some some call-outs uh, around the periphery of the vehicle that explained what all the components were, and uh, made several blueprints, uh, gave him a couple of copies of the, uh, the prints that did not have the, the call-outs, and um, he apparently was uh, showing these blueprints to anyone and everyone, uh, including the folks from the, uh, uh, the Star Trek franchise, uh, and um, he became friends with a fellow by the name of Frank Abeta Marco, who just happened to be the brother of Fred Abeta Marco uh, at Popular Science. He was the editor in chief of the magazine. And um, so Gordon left one of these blueprints with um, Frank, who mailed it to his brother Fred. And then it wound up in, I believe it was the February or March 1994 edition of Popular Science magazine. And they'd actually used the artwork before they realized uh, who had done the artwork as part of a story on Area 51, kind of a notorious issue. And that issue wound up being discussed uh, on the air by Michael Lindemann and uh, um, I think it was Art Bell. And I happened to call into the show. And then uh, by this time, um, Gordon had become aware of the fact that this had been published. And he was calling me up and threatening my life and saying he couldn't wait to see how his friends at CIA were going to have me whacked. And so at that point, I mean, I, you know, I didn't know whether he really had any uh, status as a CIA asset, as he often claimed, or not. Um, but, uh, you know, I mean, when somebody's calling you up uh, the way uh, he was and making the kinds of threats that he was and using the kind of language... You know, just to backtrack a little bit on the story and, you know, not to get too bogged down in all of this, I, I wonder, you know, what, first of all, you you drew this, right? Yeah. I mean, this was your drawing and it ended up in popular science. Yeah. So they published it and then I guess you must have come forward saying, uh, wait a minute, this is my illustration, right? Yeah. That's exactly and right. what was wrong with that, though? Because, I well, mean, that was generally, your illustration. Well, see, anytime one of those magazines would approach me about using some of my artwork, there's always a publication contract that outlines who owns the copyright. If, you know, if I'm, if I'm doing it uh, for them on their specification, then they own the copyright, they own the publication rights, they own the distribution rights, you know, and all those sorts of things. But if I create the artwork ahead of time, uh, you know, because, you know, a, a, as a hobby or for my own enjoyment right. or whatever, and then they publish it without so much as contacting me. That's a copyright infringement. I could sue for tens of thousands sure. of dollars. Sure. So they contact me right away when they realize, when they look down in the, in the little legend on the corner of the blueprint, they saw Mark McCallan. She went, oh, no, we better contact him. And, of course, I had worked for them in the past, but as it turned out, I was also working for Popular Mechanics, who was their chief competitor. And Popular Mechanics was giving me a lot more business at the time, um, about $10,000 worth of illustration work a year. And the art director and uh, editor-in-chief of Popular Mechanics uh, pretty much gave me an ultimatum, and they said that, uh, you know, if you do any more work for the other guys, uh, you know, you're not going to work for us. And so here, without any warning at all, this blueprint that Gordon gave to Frank Abeta Marco wounds up in the hands of uh, Fred Abeta Marco, who then gave it to David Hauser, the art director, and uh, they published it and realized afterwards they hadn't contacted me, that he hadn't made any contractual agreement, and they were, of course, real worried that I was going to sue him for infringement, which I did not. <laughs> but, uh, but of course, when, when Gordon saw this on the pages of Popular Science, he, he just about had a heart attack, and 
and uh, that's when the threats began. And so, but, but this is so strange. Okay, okay, we'll be right back uh, with okay. Mark McLandon. So, Mark, uh, a fascinating discussion here in, in regard to your background and, and the story about the alien reproduction vehicle, as they call it, which is just a really weird name for, for it, I have to say. Uh, so just to cut to the chase here a little bit with this part of the story, you got the thing. Uh, it was on Popular Science, and I, I guess the idea of being Gordon, for some reason, thought you were responsible for getting it on there, and you were anything but that, right? Yeah. Well, the irony was that he thought that I had let the cat out of the bag because uh, I hadn't had no desire to do that. I mean, the uh, the, uh, the gist of our original agreement was that uh, you know we keep this under our hat and we try to figure out how it worked and maybe commercialize the technology, which is something that Gordon has. Uh, been trying to do for the better part of the last 24 years, and um, the, the the real key to where the image in popular science actually came from is the fact that there are no callouts around the body of the ARV, um, and that's an indicator that it was one of the first four blueprints that were published or printed uh, before Gordon had asked me to do all the callouts, which appeared on all subsequent copies. So that means the only way the magazine could have gotten that particular uh, image is from Gordon because I never sent that particular print to anyone, never gave it to anyone. So I mean, he's the only place that it could have come from. And so, it's irony. Uh, the irony here is that he's threatening me over what he considers <laughs> to be my my breach of faith uh, when it was actually his. He, he was anxious to convince um, the people from Gene Roddenberry's group at uh, the Star Trek franchise that uh, this was real technology and they should give him a bunch of money so he could really make it and then we could all make a lot of money and. Billions well, and billions, you know. So. I mean, in in essence, he started a whole organization, yep. uh, and Hal Kudoff, I believe, is is even to this day maybe one of the members. Yeah. Uh, I haven't not, any, not, not any anymore. Longer. Okay, no. uh, and and you know, I don't know where the latest saga of that has gone, uh, but you know, just for I, it did get very involved in the CIA, and I have sort of followed it on and off through the years, and and I know Gordon has. Well, I think he's been used repeatedly as a patsy, to, to be honest with you. And, you know, the, people have varying opinions on how, much, how responsible he is for that happening to him. But nonetheless, it's really obvious to me that they kind of play a cat and mouse game with him, uh, the CIA, and utilize him when they see fit. And then they put him on the sidelines right when he's about to do anything, you know, substantial. I, I'm sure that they're going to do this eventually, but they're not going to do it. First of all, they probably won't do it with Gordon anywhere near it. And the second thing is that they, they probably won't unwrap it until uh, I have whistleblower testimony to the effect that they want to see the economies go down. They want to get through this time period between now and, I don't know, 2015, you might say, before they will allow free energy to to come back uh, onto the planet, and when they do, they want to be in complete control of it, and this is why they have been intimidating so many free energy activists through the years. Um, well, and Brian, I my share. <laughs> yeah, and and you're one of those people. So uh, if if anonymous, it, I I have to say that it's probably more likely to be an agency pretending to be anonymous as opposed to anonymous themselves. But if, if Anonymous was attacking you, it, it was with a misconception that, uh, of who you really are. Let me say, though, that, uh, that I've also noticed that you work with uh, Michael Schratt on something called the Super STOL. And I'm wondering, have you already discussed this vehicle? Uh, and how did Michael Schratt and you kind of work together? Well, that was, um, that was one of the, the odd vehicles that... Uh uh, there had been a development program. It was originally designed to replace the A-10 Warthog, which is a flying cannon, essentially. It's a, a flying anti-armor cannon. It's got the, uh, the GAL-8. I think it's a 35-millimeter Gatling gun with seven barrels. It, uh, it probably takes up about two-thirds of the entire length of the fuselage of this aircraft. It's a straight-wing aircraft with twin turbofans uh, mounted above and behind the, uh, the main wing heavily armored. It's an anti-tank aircraft. And uh, I think that um, uh, there's a good possibility that they probably approached Bert Rattan or someone of his uh, skill 
to come up with a smaller, more compact version of that aircraft, something that was capable of carrying the same kind of armament, but uh, provided a smaller airborne target for uh, anti-aircraft missiles or anti-aircraft, uh, uh, you know, machine guns and that things, um, that that kind of thing. But but uh, the the concept of a um, uh, a folding wing uh, that uh, employs something called the Coanda effect. Uh, has been around since the 1950s. In fact, the uh, I think the first version was developed by Convair or, or one of the offshoots of General Dynamics in the 1950s. I think it was called the inverted couch wing. It had three segments that extended out from the aircraft with a um, sort of a fence that would tie the, the ends together um, and that uh, the, the folding sections of the wing were um, directly behind the exhaust blast of either a propeller, a turboprop, or a jet engine. And in the case of the super stall, which means short takeoff or landing, um, is, a, uh, is a pair of small uh, turbofan jet engines with an exhaust port on it that's very much like the, uh, the exhaust diffusing technology that was used on the F-117A uh, stealth fighter. It basically takes a, a round cylindrical exhaust blast and spreads it out into a thin layer, kind of like stepping on a funnel, on the wide end of a funnel until it, it goes from a small orifice out to sort of a wide, thin uh, uh, exhaust port. And that exhaust is designed to exit over the top surface of the first in a series of five wings in the case of the Superstall. And those, uh, those wings can either be opened up like a set of Venetian blinds, so they're all uh, running at a rev- roughly uh, um, level angle of attack, in other words, horizontal to the ground or parallel to the ground, uh, with the uh, the air from the forward motion of the aircraft flowing through the vehicle and providing lift, or if all the wings, uh, the wing segments are tilted upward on a pivot point that runs along the uh, the long axis of each wing, they all come together as a single curved surface that runs from being horizontal directly behind the exhaust port of these engines to something that's nearly vertical in the in the position of the last bottom wing. They're sort of mounted coming out of the aircraft on a diagonal. Okay, I'm going to have to stop you there because I know that this, this makes perfect sense to you, but I know that my listeners are uh, <laughs> going to be getting a little lost at this point and, and sure. without... If you, uh, if you if you look up Michael Schratt, Superstall, or any of those kinds of things, you can probably find the illustration that I did for him. He, he okay. then converted into a digital image, and, and it's, it's sort of self-explanatory. If you understand that by having the exhaust blast crossing over the surface of the wing, it, it tends to hug the wing, and so if you have a series of wings that change the direction of the exhaust blast from horizontal to vertical, you essentially have a vertical takeoff and landing aircraft while also preserving... Uh, you know, relatively low forward uh, air resistance when all the wings are flattened out and you fly straight through the air. So it does represent certain advantages, but I think mechanically it just became a, a, a real maintenance nightmare, um, principally because okay. the main landing gear were mounted on the wingtips. So interesting. Well, uh, let me let me sort of change gears here a little bit with you because you know I know you have this fabulous technical background. And, and maybe in another forum, we can we could actually go into this detail. And I don't know if you're still in touch with Michael Schrapp, but it would be fascinating, at least for me and for some people, to have, hear the two of you together discussing some of these craft in just the way that you're doing and what their capabilities are, uh, the potential for them, and, and then what happened to them. I know, you know, I've interviewed Michael Schrapp. I don't know if you've seen that interview, but it's quite extensive. And, and it's in two parts, I believe. And... He has a tremendous, you know, amount of drawings and, and pictures he has gotten over the years in his interaction. He's gone around and talked to aerospace executives, as you may know. And he's also gotten some information, sort of some that may, may be considered above top secret type of information. Well, I, yes, I do know, Mike. Uh, we've been friends for probably the better part of 15 to 20 years. and. And, uh, and I like Mike very much. I know he's spoken extensively ab- about the information I've shared with him. And unfortunately, on many occasions, he's um, he hasn't gotten the story quite right. It hasn't uh, really come out the way that I told it to him. And one of the examples is the fact that he keeps maintaining that this ARV display that I described with the three saucers 
was at Norton Air Force Base in the big hangar there when in fact it was actually up at Lockheed Skunk Works. So ah. that's just one of one of a number of facts. I also, uh, when I was on the air with Art Bell, initially describing these series of events uh, probably 12 to 15 years ago, um, I indicated that this uh, this propulsion system in the Aurora aircraft uh, functioned very much like taking a wet pumpkin seed and squeezing it between your fingers and when you apply the force to the top and the bottom of the, the tail end of a pumpkin seed, it squeezes it and it pops out from between your fingers and sails away at a tremendous speed. And so for some reason, someone thought that I was calling the aircraft uh, by the codenade pumpkin seed, and Mike picked that up and ran with it and has been saying that ever since, and it's it, nothing could be further from the truth. It was never called <laughs> the pumpkin seed. It's not pumpkin seed. Okay. I was simply using the pumpkin seed as a... Uh, uh, is sort of a illustration to explain what the forces are that make it move so quickly. But well, all the more, and I have to say that if people are on the site, uh, that they can click down to the Aurora and click over to Aurora, Aurora Pulsar, I guess, to get the drawing of that, which does look like a pumpkin seed. I have to say, mm -hmm. and 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 you know, it, again, all the more reason to get the two of you together to discuss these kinds of things would be a lot of fun, and maybe with a, a few other people as well. Could I could I just mention quickly that uh, sure. uh, I did see this uh, document that you talked about on the uh, the veterans news section uh, about uh, this uh, gathering of U.S. and Chinese ships off the uh, coast of Northern California, and I, I can tell you because I live in Redding, California, that we have had a tremendous amount of UFO activity up here in the last ten years. Uh, I in fact had a sighting just uh, uh, about a week and a half ago on the 14th. Um, and uh, uh, there are people that live uh, in the mountains and the foothills west of town that are seeing things almost every single night. So there does seem to be a presence. Um, there also seems to be a military presence, um, kind of an unexplained military presence. But I can tell you from being an avid sky watcher uh, for, for decades that... Uh, uh, I noticed that there are uh, anomalous vehicles, and I'm talking about things that you know are capable of tremendous accelerations and traveling at, at, at unbelievable velocities. That, uh, for all for all other purposes, might appear to the common individual, the average person, as a as a meteor coming down through the atmosphere, when in fact uh, they are seeing the reentry of some of these advanced technology vehicles. And it it turns out that. Uh, Statistically speaking, meteors do not have a tendency to converge on the same two locations on the horizon, <laughs> night after night after night. And so it became very obvious in, in just a matter of a year or two, in just talking to other people that have noticed the same phenomenon that I have, that there seem to be two specific locations. One is in the Trinity Alps, about 60 to 70 miles uh, west of Red Ending, and another uh, near Tom's Head Mountain, west of uh, Red Bluff, which is, I think, about 40 miles south of Redding. And these two locations apparently seem to be uh, locations that uh, um, accept the uh, the recovery of these kinds of aircraft. And and in fact, it turns out that one of those two locations, the the one going out towards Trinity Alp, also happens to be uh, the general location of the first uh, uh, what was believed to be the first legitimate film of Bigfoot. And that also happens to fall right smack dab in the middle of a, uh, a major Indian reservation. Now, there was something published uh, within the last year or two saying that uh, there were some people who were uh, seriously speculating that uh, the CIA, because its charter prevents it from operating within the continental United States, that they are actually operating out of and with the permission of the leaders of a number of uh, Indian reservations, these, these areas being considered to be the sovereign land of these Native American tribes, and therefore would not be in violation of the CIA charter by... Uh, not only leasing uh, land or you know under underground areas, if you will, uh, uh -huh. but would also uh, afford these tribes a tremendous millions and millions of dollars, maybe even billions of dollars, that they could then use to uh, you know improve the the lot of their their tribe and educate their kids and this kind of thing. So, you know, I have a friend who's an Indian, and he's made several efforts to contact the uh, the leaders of the particular tribe for that particular reservation, and he's had absolutely no luck at all. It's uh, a rather mysterious kind of situation. Oh, but yes. It seems to tie in very well with this story about Chinese and American uh, ships off the coast of Northern California that are uh, um, allegedly dealing with, uh, you know, some 
um, aggressive and hostile off-world presence. Okay, well, that's that's very interesting. Have you heard any word of, I know it sounds extreme to people who are probably listening, but uh, I, I did know a, a filmmaker who, who actually filmed battles uh, between craft over at Los Angeles. Also have a, a copy of a film that I made of a film that, that was circulating of this SDS footage. I think it's the SDS footage where they actually are shooting at something and you can clearly see that a missile or something was shot at a at a UFO. So I, I just wondered if you heard anything about any kind of battles in the skies. Uh, I am convinced that chemtrails actually, and I wanted to talk to you about this and run this by you because we didn't get a real chance to uh, talk about it on Paul Price's show the other day. I wanted to talk about the idea that what I often notice is is that chemtrails seem to also put a, a kind of a wall between us and the and the higher atmosphere, and so that you can't see what's going on above that. And I believe that they're masking. They're not only being able to get a signature from an incoming craft, but they're also able to mask any kind of battles going on above our heads. Well, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, if you if you look at the history of uh, camouflage in the U.S. military, and you don't have to look too far, I think uh, an excellent book that was published a number of years ago um, was published by a friend of mine. It was called uh, Stealth, the Art of Black Magic by Joseph Jones, whose uh, house was burned to the ground subsequent to the publication of that book after he received uh, threats and a warning about make sure you've got, uh, you know, your fire insurance paid up. Um, so he, uh, but he did mention uh, some things in that book, and there have been a number of things published since that time that suggest that uh, if you go back and you look at some of the um, the, the technologies, simple at first, but but uh, more sophisticated, more complex as time went on, they were used to defeat uh, radar and infrared uh, types of uh, targeting systems. Um, this is the same kind of technology that when you sort of micro miniaturize it winds up being applied um, also in uh, in uh, chemtrails now let me what do I mean by that well uh, back in the beginning when um, when the Navy was interested in obscuring the presence of their ships um, uh, being seen and targeted with uh, heavy armor or, or uh, you know uh, uh, heavy cannons over the horizon. Uh, sometimes they would have a, a blimp or a, you know a biplane come in and and dump a bunch of uh, powder into the air to make it look like a cloud on you know way out on the horizon, so the uh, superstructure of the ship could not be seen uh, by an enemy warship. Uh, eventually, they begin using other things that would actually reflect or uh, prevent uh, radar transmissions, uh, a radio frequency or RF signal, uh, from reaching the ships and being reflected back to the antenna that was responsible for the initial transmission. So uh, as time went on, they also began to apply this kind of technology in uh, aircraft when um, we went beyond using simple machine guns and shooting, you know, one plane shooting another plane down in these uh, dogfights that were happening right at the end of the First World War and into the Second World War with the advent of radar and the, the ability to use radar to target aircraft, not only with gun systems, but with some of the early missiles, um, they began looking for ways to use uh, materials that you could spread or spray into the air that would uh, confuse the, the, the targeting system, the homing beacon, if you will, of these uh, uh, radar-guided missiles and, and other kinds of weapon systems that would try to shoot down a plane. And so uh, one of the, the techniques they used was... Uh, putting what they call chaff or little filaments of aluminum foil uh, into the atmosphere around a plane. And typically what would happen is this plume of, uh, of aluminum particles would create a, a stronger reflection for the, uh, the signal that was being used by the, the homing device in the missile. And so the missile would fly into this cloud of aluminum thinking that it hit the airplane and it would blow up in this cloud of aluminum particles and not hit the plane. And so the plane would survive and on you go. So as time went on, they began finding that uh, the, you could use smaller and smaller particles and they began to discover that that not only could you affect uh, the, the meteorology of the area, the weather, uh, because uh, these particles would also reflect sunlight and would cause the atmosphere to cool, but they also began to realize that you could uh, 
you could also mask the infrared signature of, say, of a jet engine. You could use these things to make it difficult uh, for an enemy force to be able to see the, the heat signature, the infrared signature of your uh, the exhaust for your jet engines, um, especially if you're at a higher altitude. Um, a lot of this, of course, uh, presupposes that you're putting this material into the air ahead of time so that when the, the really valuable system flies overhead, people on the ground won't be able to use any of their sensor arrays to see these things flying at higher altitudes and presumably going into territorial airspace that's, uh, you know, will be a violation of a treaty somewhere. So. Well, sure. Uh, it can be used in that way, but if you take it and you reverse the whole scenario, oh, yeah, the, same, the same thing, direction. yeah. It, it, it works both ways. So, so if you want to shield, on the one hand, you could shield your own craft from flying over certain areas, but on the other hand, you could also possibly use it as a reflective device of some kind, turning the, the thing into sort of a, a radar soup. As it, you know, it is an interesting concept, the whole idea of what, you know, because I actually, this corkscrew, it's kind of funny you said this thing about corkscrews on a string. I just saw, I was out by the beach uh, walking my dog yesterday, actually, and saw exactly that kind of a chemtrail across the sky. Cork screws on a string or donuts on a ring? Donuts, oh. donuts on a string or donuts on a rope? Or Something like I that, I yes. Think I, I don't think I said corkscrew, but... Uh, okay, well, yeah, okay, that was, that was my, my phraseology. Yes, uh, donuts on a rope, as you called it. Mm. Sure. Uh, and I, just fascinating. I, I, you know, I don't know, I didn't see the craft that... That laid the trail. I just saw the trail, um, well, but it was lingering know, for quite a while. But see, there's there's so many different things that could come into play. I mean, not only could these particles, you know, whether it's aluminum oxide uh, or titanium dioxide or you know, uh, silver iodide, you know, all of these these chemicals, uh, and this is these are things that are addressed in the, the latest film by Michael Murphy, Why in the World Are They Spraying. Uh, a lot of these things have different levels of reactivity with the, the moisture in the air, uh, with the sunlight, and, and even um, different levels of reactivity with the, the radar and, and other kinds of electromagnetic uh, transmissions that are sent at these uh, clouds of particles. Now, um, you probably remember a, a TV commercial for, I think it was BASF, one of the tape manufacturing companies where Ella Fitzgerald hits a particular note and she shatters a, a crystal champagne glass and then they play the tape recording of her voice back and it's able to do the same thing. Yes. Now that's an example of her hitting the resonant frequency of that glass and causing such a disturbing a vibration within the material of the glass that it shatters. Now these particles that are being manufactured, these nanoparticles, there's probably half a dozen different manufacturing techniques that they can use to create these particles. and What's what's really uh, you know remarkable about these particles is that they're all uniform in size. In other words, they can pick out say something that's a hundred na nanometers across, uh, something that might you know you line up uh, you know ten or a dozen of these things next to a red blood cell, and it gives you an idea of just how truly small they are. But they're you know we're talking about millions of tons of this material with all of these little tiny particles that are all exactly the same size. So imagine then that you spray this material into the air and you know, you just happen to know, that each one of those 100 nanometer particles floating in the air made of aluminum is not only electrically conductive, but that it has a resonant frequency that is in the, the gigawatt or, uh, or, excuse me, gigacycle, uh, a billion cycles per second, um, you know, range of the uh, the radar spectrum, and you hit it with a signal from a uh, from a device or a, an array like the Harp Array up in Kokona, Alaska, with a focused uh, beam of RF energy. And what happens is this particular area where this uh, material has been distributed, uh, all of these particles uh, resonate at that particular gigahertz frequency. And when they do, they begin to heat up. And because there's so many billions and billions of these particles, they heat the surrounding air. The surrounding air uh, not only expands, but it rises to a higher altitude. And, and because these particles are so small, the humidity, the moisture in the air accumulates. is sequestered by this material, so it's all carried to a higher altitude where it creates a low-pressure system and then creates these powerful storms. And because there's so much of this conductive aluminum in the cloud, you get much 
uh, you know, much heavier lightning strikes, so you see more forest fires. And the worst of the whole part of this thing is that the aluminum oxide nanoparticles, when they will eventually fall out and land back on the ground, they're small enough to be absorbed into the root systems of plants that get into the soil and change the alkalinity. And uh, it turns out that aluminum oxide is one of the components used in superthermate, the very kinds of materials that they've alleged were used to bring down the World Trade Center as uh, these high-temperature explosives that are used to uh, do controlled demolition of buildings. So you've, you've suddenly... Interesting, put, uh, yeah. A very, very uh, poisonous kind of concoction is what we've oh, yeah. got. Well, in um, fact, uh, you, know, you, you can go up on the Defense Te Technical Information Center website and find a paper that was... Uh, uh, published as the result of a 10-year study that was uh, done at Wright-Patterson Air Force uh, Base uh, talking about the effect of these particles, aluminum oxide nanoparticles, and the toxicology that is created uh, uh, and how they affect the ability of the white blood cells in the alveoli of the lungs, the little air sacs that expand and contract when you breathe. It actually uh, undermines the ability of this front line of defense in your immune system to engulf and kill pathogens that come in through your respiratory tract. And so you can see how not only could this kind of material be used to destroy forests so they can then be harvested for millions of dollars and covered by insurance to many times their actual value through, value through derivatives and the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, but you can see how these things can be used to destroy crops that are not resistant to aluminum oxide. It can be used to, uh, to harm people and undermine their health so that pharmaceutical companies can make more money on the medicines that they give to people who are having respiratory distress and COPD and everything. I mean, it's insidious. Well, it, it, is, it, it becomes a delivery system. Uh, I want to get into, uh, I think I heard the music there, and we're going to have to come back after the break, but I want to get into the idea of the delivery system itself. And I've got a, got some, some intel to read to you, uh, to the audience as well. We'll be right back. Okay, this is Carrie Cassidy, Project Camelot with the Blower Radio, and we're talking to Mark McCandlish. And Mark, fascinating. Thank you for going over the science of all of that. I, I wanted to interject here that I do have some intel that came to me from a source that I, I'd like to get your feedback on. So I want okay. to read that to you. And uh, I, I guess just right before you were talking about this sort of concoction and how it get, gets into the soil as well as into the uh, interferes with the immune system, it can also be a delivery device as, as uh, it, you're basically describing it. And I have some information that I'm not real happy to be putting out there, but it is about possible viruses that they are planning to unleash on the public in October and I have some dates on my blog if you're interested in that. But what one of the contacts out there is saying that, that, that it may come by way of chemtrail. We've now got two pretty solid sources on this information. So for what it's worth, one of them is, uh, is really in, from within an agency and, and currently works at an agency. And I, for the life of me, don't know what would be the purpose uh, you know, how that person would be able to put that information out so easily, you know, and not kind of fear for their life if, if that indeed is a plan. There may be the thought that, you know, they don't care because they're just going to do what they want to do. On the other hand, maybe the, the hope is by the individual, because nobody likes this sort of thing, um, to stop it. And, and so then, you know, I guess there's, there's a reason to, to announce that there may be a plan underfoot. But I just wanted to throw that out there. I wanted to talk about delivery systems in general because you who know aircraft have to understand or in theory would understand that this solution, this concoction that they put up, and, and given that it may not be the same solution all the time and it may not be distributed by the same kinds of planes all the times either, as it's, it's not. said not, yeah, not to be. So... The, it's it is fascinating to me the the limited if if any number of whistleblowers who've ever come out about the the actual delivery process behind chemtrails. Well, um, um, I'll say this: um, there are probably a dozen different things that chemtrails uh, could serve in the in terms of the purpose uh, for which they might be sprayed. I mean, I even came across a scientific paper that suggested that you could add aluminum oxide nanoparticles of something uh, in the neighborhood of uh, 
uh, 40, uh, 40 nanometers across into the fuel itself at 40% by weight. And that, you know, the first thing that everyone thinks of is that, uh, you know, these nanoparticles of aluminum oxide will get in there and erode the turbine blades. But in fact, what happens is that when you heat aluminum oxide up in the combustion process, it releases uh, all of the oxygen. It's uh, two aluminum uh, atoms and three atoms of oxygen. And so this is why it creates such high temperatures, but when it's combined in a process with other kinds of fuel, it can actually enhance combustion efficiency. And so because you're actually, uh, actually in, you're, you're literally including the oxygen supply for the combustion process right in the fuel itself, you can take aircraft to much higher altitudes where the air is really thin, and as long as your control surfaces will still allow you to control the flight characteristics of the plane, you can travel and fly at much higher altitudes by putting this stuff in the fuel because you're taking your oxygen with you, albeit totally inert, up in the fuel. So this is one thing. Um, you know, of course, we, we've, we've heard endless discussions about, you know, how you can affect the weather, how you can have an impact on, on uh, you know, different environments by changing the temperature, steering the jet stream, and these kinds of things. But there's, there's also some other things that could be used. I mean, even, say, in the form of, say, an, an ICBM ballistic missile defense system. Now, if you look back to the destruction of the Columbia Space Shuttle, and you do any research on that, you'll find that uh, there was an amateur astronomer in the San Francisco Bay Area who happened to be, um, he wanted to make a time exposure of the shuttle coming back through the atmosphere, and he happened to catch uh, what appears to be a, a huge bolt of lightning coming down out of the ionosphere and striking the right wing of the, uh, the shuttle and basically blowing a big hole in it, and that's when the destruction of Columbia began. But you have to understand also that, that if you were pumping the ionosphere with lots of energy from the HARP system, or if you're actually uh, in contributing to the conductivity of the atmosphere by putting conductive microscopically sized particles into the atmosphere, aluminum oxide chemtrails, uh, you're, you're actually uh, enhancing the pathway that the electricity wants to travel through when it's trying to neutralize or equalize the electrical charge that exists between the, the high reaches of the atmosphere, the ionosphere, and the ground itself. And if you have a, a vehicle that's passing through the area, whether it's an ICBM missile that's coming in on its final uh, you know, approach before it blows up, or the space shuttle, which is leaving you know, a trail of ions because of the, the shuttle tiles you know, burning off, you know, these are all things that uh, enhance those pathways of conductivity and actually encourage these uh, strikes of what is called mega lightning. And this could be used, uh, you know, in, a, in a, uh, a serious way to not only destroy ICBMs, the space shuttle, uh, or enemy uh, spacecraft from another world. I mean, if you, if you want to, you know, take it to the... Right, the, and I remember, yeah, I, I remember you talking about that on Paul Price's show, and I, I was very struck by that. Uh, I think that's a fascinating theory, and I, I think that, it, that, that it's very likely being used. In other words, it, it sounds... Uh, it sounds like they couldn't help but, but want to use that as a process. But it, what it doesn't do is sort of answer how, again, I, I hear that you're saying the delivery system would be, in theory, possibly in the fuel itself. That seems well, that's, like a possibility. That's, that's one way. I mean, I, I know that uh, many of the chemtrails that people see um, uh, seem to be attributed to the exhaust of the planes, and this is why at least in the beginning, so many people said, oh, no, this is just, uh, you know, there's a water injection system on some of these aircraft engines to to uh, keep the turbine blades cooler or what have you, and you're just seeing, you know, a lot more moisture that's being condensed into the cold atmosphere after these hot jet engines pass. Uh, but but contrails, condensation trails, in, in the original sense of the word, do not persist for hours or days or even weeks in some instances. And uh, but uh, uh, engines that are being enhanced by the use of aluminum oxide nanoparticles, or engines that that have a uh, a system that includes the the spraying of these particles into the exhaust stream, um, you know, they create uh, trails and clouds that persist for for hours and days afterwards and tend to spread out and 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 literally affect uh, the weather and the the temperature on the ground. Oh yeah, they they drastically change change. I mean, I've watched it day after day, uh, and I, I 
actually when I was working out at JPL, I'm not sure whether they were actually doing it there or why it was so clear, but that there was one, uh, uh, you know, summer when I was working out there where you would start out in the morning and they would, the chemtrails would come, they'd cloud over the sky completely so you could see nothing above a certain level and they would persist the entire day and then they would dissipate at a certain hour and the, the whole process would be repeated again the following day. Um, like clockwork. And yeah, I know. It, it does appear to me, uh, I'm in complete agreement with you because being here in Northern California and, you know, with what seems to be, uh, a, a, a tremendous amount of, uh, of, uh, flight operations of some kind of really advanced aircraft and, uh, you know, I don't really know who is responsible for piloting those aircraft, but, but it seems apparent to me that the camp trailing that we see here uh, seems to closely match the the number of sightings in terms of the days of the week, the times of the day or the night. For example, this evening, uh, there was just a, a, a mild amount of chemtrailing um, during the, the course of the day here. But then as, as it got uh, later in the afternoon, we see a tremendous amount of chemtrailing way out to the west, beyond the coastal mountain range, which, of course, because of the prevailing weather patterns, will drift into our area. And Redding is probably one of the larger... I wouldn't really call it a metropolitan area, but it's one of the larger population centers in Northern California. And, uh, you know, it's, so if you, if you want to obscure, uh, you know, the, the sky in such a way that a local population will not see what you're doing with your, your advanced technology weapon systems, I suppose that would be a, a way to do it. But it, it seems to me that, you know, I've noticed that uh, these kinds of things typically happen on a Friday evening or a Sunday evening. And if you look at the, the schedule that most federal employees are on, particularly the ones that work uh, after dark, you find that these times coincide with when uh, classified aircraft are launched or uh, are, uh, are recovered uh, at the end of uh, a long period of time. So uh, generally at the beginning or the end of the normal work week. So um, even the people who live out in the foothills to the west of Reading who talk about these so-called UFO sightings, and they even have UFO watching parties because it's become such a deal up here. But uh, even they have said, in fact, I talked to a person today who told me that they noticed almost no activity on the weekend, which suggests, you know, a sort of a, uh, a weekly schedule, very much like something in keeping with what you'd expect from military operations. Uh, yeah, very interesting. Uh, this is current intel, and I haven't yet put it on the site, but I will be doing so. It says... The U.S. military is apparently moving all kinds of Air Force and Army people to Hawaii. The official word being leaked is that it is to counter a Chinese threat. They are moving many units from Alaska as well as Washington, but no Navy is being shifted. And uh, the person writing this says that that seems very strange. Another person says that they can validate that there are official releases about the shifts that F-22s to Hawaii uh, are, are going and that there are also a few going to Guam. But they're basically stripping Alaska of any form of rapid deployment air defense. And they're saying the same with the East Washington State Air Force units. Some of the regular army from Fort Lewis area seems to be moving there there's also a, a strange thing about this whole hawaii thing another person is saying that uh there's been a dwindling army base and a presence on on hawaii up and that all of a sudden they're building it up which doesn't seem to make overt sense but if you look at this what uh well if you listen if anyone who's on the listening out there had heard my radio show last week with douglas dietrich this, of course, would make sense along those lines because he, just to clue you in, he was talking about he has a background as both Chinese and Japanese in his heritage. And he is talking about the interaction between what is the, I guess, communist Chinese and the U.S. military working together to the exclusion of Japan in part because they feel that Japan is related to the, the group that may be one of the hostile groups that we're supposedly at war with or some form of, of aggravated um, interactions, whatever you want to call that, and um, yeah. that it's well, this, partially this sounds, because sounds, of... Let me just finish. a little bit like the uh, material coming from Benjamin Fulford about the Yakuza things of that nature and I well really this sure. is no this isn't really going in that direction uh, they're talking about Fukushima 
specifically okay. and the fact that it was caused and that there may be um, there may be something in other words this what I'm telling you now is is, is about a military shifting of, of energy going in the direction of Hawaii and into the Pacific theater as you know in military language and whereas the article that Gordon Duff released could indeed be nothing but disinfo there is reason to believe according to at least Douglas Dietrich who was a researcher for the military in the Presidio and spent many years as a researcher and has a, a very fascinating background talking about what what might be going on in the Pacific uh, and, and isn't being revealed. Now, um, they're also saying that money and material is supposedly, that, that is being said to be used in Afghanistan is, is not being used there. That patrols so, and, let me, and missions... Let me see if I understand you correctly. Are you saying then that they, they've, they've stipulated that this is not the drawdown from Afghanistan and uh, the, the Middle East, that these are not troop movements that involve people that are coming back from those deployments, but these are actually new deployments of troops from the continental United States and Alaska that are going into the Pacific Theater. Is that what he's saying? Yes. That, that's what's being described here. Now, this is separate. This doesn't, you know, come from Dietrich, and it, it's it's completely different in, set of intel. All I'm saying is is that it, it's interesting. It came in a lot later than this other information came, you know, that came out, and does seem to indicate some some shifting, some emphasis in. It's certainly a, a focus around Hawaii, which is interesting, uh, and, and I'm just throwing that out there, you know. Uh, in other words, sure. I don't have uh, anything else to say about that, other than than I wanted people to to realize that that was was actually being uh, reported. And there are other things being reported too. I mean, we, we get, you know, you can, you have to absolutely look at the intel that we get and, and some of it is very, very good. We do have very good sources. Some of them are military. So they, it, I, I wouldn't be discounting the information completely. But on the other hand, putting it together and adding it all up and what, what it ends up to be is another matter. Yeah. Well, if I if I could comment on the earlier uh, intel about uh, the deployment of pathogenic viruses in October and so forth, um, I would like to uh, just let your audience know that if they go up on the Internet and they look for alternative therapies for viruses, you'll find that uh, there's been a lot of great research recently by uh, a number of scientists up in the University of Reykjavik in Iceland about the benefits of coconut milk. There's a substance in coconut milk called lauric acid that turns to monolaurin when it's processed by your liver, and it actually inhibits and blocks the replication of viruses. I've actually used this to cure kittens that had feline leukemia virus that are now still with me two years later because of this fact. And there's also L-lysine and zinc gluconate, which is in a lot of the, uh, the cold remedies. But uh, coconut milk in particular has shown such promise as an antiviral agent that they're actually researching it right now as a cure for AIDS, HIV AIDS. So uh, you know, my, yes. my, yeah, my suggestion to the audience would be if you have any, if you think there's any credibility to these warnings uh, and you have concerns about, uh, you know, unusual viruses coming into your particular region or area, stock up on coconut milk and do it as soon as you can. Uh, well, yes, and th there is a, a, a coconut, uh, I actually use this, it's, it's a kind of a coconut um, sort of solution that, that is coconut itself and uh, so you don't actually have to use the milk if you. There are other ways to get it. Um, well, even the coconut meat, milk, uh, the, even the coconut meat itself has the same particular material in it. This, this yes. same substance. Um, in fact, I, uh, I told a bunch of friends here in the Reading area, and suddenly all the stores were out of coconut milk. And so this one lady, <laughs> when she got a cold, uh, flew out of. Uh, Desperation, she went down to a local market and she got an actual coconut, read up online about how to cut, um, you know, cut it open and get the meat and the milk out of it. And she said that her her virus symptoms were gone within six hours. So, you know, it's wonderful. Just, uh, yeah. yeah. So, so it seems like that. You know, people reaching out and helping one another uh, when you know we're basically trying to, uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> stop from being rolled over by the steamroller of you know corporate governments worldwide. Absolutely. Well, I, I, that's very valuable. So what I'd like to do now is, is see if we have any callers. Uh, people are able to call into this phone number 
here at uh, Revolution Radio. So if, if anyone does want to call in, we can also do that. Um, and in the meantime, we also have chat rooms. We've got two chat rooms. Uh, one of them uh, I, I have on Project Camelot. It's, it's, there are a lot of people that are always on the chat room during the show. And uh, so if you have any questions, please put them in the chat. Uh, we'll see if we can get to them in the last few minutes here. We've got about 10 minutes left or less. Um, and I'm skimming the chat room right now to see if there's anything. Somebody is asking if you think that chemtrails have any kind of occult or Luciferian purpose, uh, whereby dark frequencies are allowed to give darker forces more power. Well, I, 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 let me tell you this. I, I know that uh, as uh, mysterious and strange as it sounds, you know there may be more to that than you think. And, and by that, I mean that if you have... Um, uh, agencies of government or you have, uh, you know, uh, organizations that are extremely well funded in the hundreds of billions of dollars and have the ability to use these kinds of technologies, uh, it's entirely possible to control the thought processes and the emotional stability of people in a given region by bombarding that region with particular frequencies that resonate within the human brain cavity and you could do, you can control this so that it affects either adults or young adults or, you know, adults because uh, the different size, uh, sizes of the skull, uh, the, the brain cavity in, the, you know, an adult is, of course, larger, so it's a lower frequency than a child who has a smaller uh, brain cavity. And, and uh, you know, if you pulse these particular frequencies at uh, a particular, say you have a high frequency tone that you're sending out, and you pulse it at a low frequency, basically it's kind of like a high-pitched beep happening at 25 pulses per second that you can induce not only, uh, you know, a sense of depression, uh, suicidal tendencies, uh, aggressive behavior. There's a lots of different things that, uh, that you can do. And so if you, if you want to create, uh, uh, you know, a sensation of fear in a population, you want to uh, enhance uh, their worries about the outcome of the next election or you know, some kind of an earthquake or what have you. You know, you can always magnify the fear level in a population by using these kinds of techniques. And harp, of course, and chemtrails are things, uh, you know, methods or or uh, materials that can be brought to use to enhance those capabilities. So whether or not someone actually would have such a horrendous motive, uh, you know, do something like that is, is really kind of beyond my um, uh, knowledge to, in order to comment on, but yeah, I, I think it's entirely possible. Sure, uh, absolutely. And there's another question here asking you, uh, do you think the black triangles are ET tech or our own secret mil military tech? Um, well, it turns out the sighting that I had uh, just a week and a half ago on the 14th at uh, 1.45 in the morning was a triangle. It was the first black triangle that I've seen. Um, what was kind of disarming about the sighting was that it was absolutely silent. Now, I know from some of my work in the defense industry that uh, going back to the early 1990s that McDonnell Douglas was uh, manufacturing a triangular-shaped uh, stealth aircraft that worked in coordination with the, uh, the F-117A during the, uh, the first Iraq War, the Persian Gulf War. Uh, and these aircraft were target designators. They were called the TR-3. Um, now, uh, it's been my information that those particular vehicles were recently mothballed. So there may be a newer generation, something that uses a, a more advanced technology that has the same basic appearance in terms of its uh, its uh, shape in the sky. Uh, but it's entirely possible, based on some of the eyewitness accounts that we've had in the last few years, that these these vehicles are employing uh, propulsion systems that are that are far more advanced, uh, you know, much more sophisticated, and use you know gravity and and things of that nature. So, so it, it's entirely possible that this is just uh, you know the the latest and greatest from the Department of Defense, and it's also possible that it might be something that's coming from off world. It's just hard to say. Okay, uh, fair enough. <laughs> Uh, someone is asking a good question here, uh, in my opinion, uh, which is how much chemtrail activity is military as opposed to corporate agendas like Monsanto? Well, uh, I, I personally think that uh, about 90% of it is uh, corporate. 
And, uh, you know, if you, if you take a look at that film, Why in the World is Spraying, it's very obvious that companies like Monsanto and DuPont have a vested interest, particularly, uh, you know, if they're, uh, in bed with the, uh, the companies that are spraying and they can predict when a weather disaster will destroy crops in one part of a, a country or another. Um, and, uh, you know, put, uh, you know, $5 billion into insuring a crop that's, uh, you know, that's worth only, say, uh, you know, 750 million. So the return is much greater when, in fact, the uh, the planned weather disaster happens. You get much more money than if you harvested the crop and it sold on the market. So this is the thing that's driving this kind of economic activity. People are making a lot of money, but at the same time, crops are being destroyed and people are going hungry. So you know, it's it's. Uh, I I think that uh, you know it, it it almost looks as though uh, some people have become so enamored with. Uh, you know, reaping the rewards of uh, insurance claims uh, that they've completely lost sight of the benefits of the crops and the people that they feed. So, uh, you know. Okay, well, uh, I guess we're running down here uh, out of time. And uh, I just want to say that thank you so much, Mark McCandlish, for coming on the show. Uh, I, I actually am not so sure that, that the, the ratio is that way. I, I have a, a, a strong feeling that the military leads the charge in this direction and that the, uh, the companies are just benefiting from sort of the scraps on the side that do generate a huge amount of money. But I, I think the initial uh, push came from the military on this. That's my thought. I'd love to talk to you some more about all of this. It would be great to have you back again soon. Well, thank you for having me. I'd love to come back. Thank you so much. Okay, you take care. Thanks, everyone. Have a great weekend. Thank you for listening to Revolution Radio.